I get asked a lot about contraceptive options that don't involve hormonal birth control. In fact, I received this question on my Instagram which said, I'm getting married soon and I'm afraid of starting hormonal contraceptives because I'm worried that it's going to mess up my menstrual cycle. I'd highly appreciate your advice on which contraceptive I should look into. So if we think about it logically, you can only get pregnant for about five to six days throughout your cycle. And the reason for this is because when you ovulate, an egg can only last or survive for 12 to 24 hours. And sperm can only survive in your body between about three and five days. So if you add those two together, it really only gives you about a five or six day window for you to potentially get pregnant throughout a menstrual cycle. And if you typically have a 28 day menstrual cycle, it means that in a month, you only have a very small window in which you can potentially get pregnant. And so when we take hormonal contraception, you're essentially shutting down your own body's hormonal fluctuations. And in so doing, you may be putting yourself at risk for hormone disruption and for a host of side effects that I think a lot of us just kind of overlook when we think about taking hormonal birth control. And so if you have, you know, read up on the side effects of hormonal birth control and you've made an informed decision to take hormonal birth control, then that's all very well and good. But if you are looking for a contraceptive method that doesn't come with all the potential side effects and risk factors of hormonal birth control, then choosing a hormone-free contraceptive method may be something worthwhile looking into. Now, if you've been prescribed the birth control pill, for period problems and not to prevent pregnancy, then I'd highly recommend trying to get to the bottom of why you are experiencing your period problems so that you can get to the root cause and address that cause so that you don't actually need the birth control to manage your symptoms. But if you were just looking to prevent pregnancy um, and you don't want to go on hormonal birth control, here are some options that you can look into. So the first group of hormone-free birth control options is what we call barrier methods or barrier contraception. So as the name suggests, barrier contraceptive methods create a barrier of entry for sperm getting into the uterus to potentially fertilize an egg. And so some examples of barrier contraceptives would include condoms. And this includes male and female condoms. Now, for some people using condoms, especially within the context of a long-term relationship or a marriage can be a little bit inconvenient. However, this is a great contraceptive method that not only prevents pregnancy, but also helps to protect you against sexually transmitted infections. So when looking for a condom brand, I would highly suggest looking into toxin-free brands if you have those available to you. Because remember that the vaginal canal does have a really rich blood supply. And so if you're exposed to nasty chemicals that could be in the condoms that you're using, then you could be putting yourself at risk inadvertently when using them. So look out for um, toxin-free condom brands, but essentially this is a great way to use contraception as and when you need it so that you're not putting yourself at risk throughout the month just to prevent pregnancy on a sh over a short period of time. The next barrier contraceptive method is the diaphragm. And this is typically a latex or silicone dome that rests and creates a seal up against the vaginal walls and essentially covers the cervix and creates a barrier um, preventing sperm from entering into the uterus. This contraceptive method um, can be inserted two hours before intercourse and must be kept in place at least for six hours after intercourse. You won't be able to feel it, so it won't interrupt anything um, while it is in place. But this barrier contraceptive method will not protect you against sexually transmitted infections. 
The next barrier contraceptive method is the cervical cap. Now this is similar to the diaphragm but quite a bit smaller. It really fits snugly over the cervix and again creates a barrier of entry for sperm getting into the uterus. You can keep a cervical cap on for up to two days and again you don't feel it during intercourse and again it also won't, won't protect you against sexually transmitted infections. Okay so moving on to hormone free contraceptive methods that are not barrier methods. And the first one here is the withdrawal method also called the pull out method or coitus interruptus. And this is a contraceptive method that has been used for thousands of years and it's basically where the man will withdraw before he ejaculates. And so this contraceptive method does have a higher um, chance of failure and again won't prevent um, against sexually transmitted infections. And you really are relying on your partner to take control of this contraceptive method. Um, so it is something to consider perhaps as an interim uh, contraceptive method. But it is a contraceptive method that you may consider using in combination with another contraceptive method that I'll touch on later. Um, but ultimately, this is a contraceptive method that is still widely practiced. And if this is done with 100% accuracy, as accurate as it can get, then the failure rate comes all the way down to approximately 6%, which is about on par with other contraceptive methods such as condoms. The next hormone-free contraceptive method is the copper IUD or intrauterine device. Now this is a little device that's made of plastic and copper that is inserted into the uterus to prevent pregnancy. It works in two ways. So it helps to reduce or paralyze sperm, so it reduces the mobility of sperm um, so that they don't swim up to fertilize the egg. And it also creates like a hostile environment inside the uterus so that a fertilized egg will not implant. As a result, it can be an effective contraceptive method that doesn't actually release any hormone. So that's hormone free. You do get other intrauterine devices that do release hormones but the copper IUD is completely hormone free so the benefit here is that you don't actually get disruption of your normal menstrual cycle because it does not prevent ovulation so you will still ovulate as normal and have a period as normal it's just that it's there and preventing um, fertilization as well as preventing implantation of a fertilized egg and so what are some of the benefits of the, IU, the copper IUD? So like we said, it doesn't involve any hormones. It's not going to disrupt your normal menstrual cycle. It can also be used as an emergency contraceptive. And typically you don't feel it. You don't even know it's there and it can last for, it can basically be inserted and left in the uterus for up to 10 years. So it kind of just like removes the headache of having to think about your contraceptive method. But the, contra the copper IUD doesn't come without its potential side effects. And so some of the side effects include a little bit of pain or discomfort after insertion. So typically a copper IUD would need to be inserted um, in a doctor's office or in a clinic. Um, if you've ever had a pap smear, then it's kind of a similar process. You um, would basically have a speculum inserted into the vaginal canal and then your healthcare provider would visualize or look at your cervix and then insert the copper IUD through the cervix into the uterus. So you don't need to go to theater, you don't, it's not an operation, so you don't need to be sedated at all. Um, so it can be a little bit uncomfortable and it can take a little bit longer than a pap smear would typically take. And so it helps to just kind of relax and not clench up and you know uh, contract too much because that actually increases your um, discomfort level and so essentially after the IUD has been placed you may experience a bit of cramping a bit of discomfort a bit of pain similar to period pain if you experience period pain 
The other thing about the copper IUD is that some people do experience heavier bleeding after it has been put in place. And so if you already battle with heavy periods, then this is something to think about when considering your contraceptive options. But ultimately, for a lot of people who experience the heavy bleeding after the copper IUD, it does tend to settle down after a few months. But if it's not settling down and it's really increasing the amount of blood loss that you're experiencing every time you have a period, then you may want to consider an alternative contraceptive option. Another thing that can happen is that the IUD can actually come out. So sometimes your uterus just contracts and you know, pushes the IUD out. So this can happen, it can occur. Um, it's not a very common uh, thing to occur, but it's something to keep in mind that it actually may fall out. And this could potentially lead to pain and a bit of spotting and discomfort. The IUD also increases your risk of infections. So after the IUD has been placed, the end of the IUD has like a string that kind of sits or like in the similar way to how a tampon string would um, hang outside of your body, the strings of the copper IUD will hang outside of your cervix. And that is so that when it's time to remove the copper IUD, so that it's easy for the healthcare practitioner to actually locate the strings and pull the IUD out using those strings. And so because those strings protrude through the cervix into the vaginal canal, there is a chance that the bugs that, you know, the bacteria um, that are inside the vaginal canal can actually track up that string into the uterus. And so this could potentially increase your risk of certain infections and even increase your chances of getting bacterial vaginosis, where the balance of bacteria inside the vaginal canal is disrupted and then you get this discharge that typically has a fishy odor. The next hormone-free contraceptive method is the fertility awareness method. Now, this is one of my favorite contraceptive method be methods because it relies on the fact that you can only get pregnant for a very short window of time within your menstrual cycle. Now, the fertility awareness method should not be confused with the rhythm method. The rhythm method is a way of predicting when you will ovulate based on your previous menstrual cycle history and so typically this would involve looking at a calendar tracking your period and then estimating when you ovulated based on your menstrual cycles this is kind of similar to what period apps will do so period apps generally try to predict when you have ovulated based on the input that you have um, submitted in the previous menstrual cycle so that's why period tracking apps tend to get more and more accurate as you complete more information. But the period apps that you're using and the rhythm method using just a calendar and tracking your period, both cannot accurately say when you have ovulated. The only accurate way to know when you have ovulated is by monitoring a few different parameters. And so that's what the fertility awareness method is about. The rhythm method and using period tracking apps are great to give you like an idea of what's going on, but they are incomplete and they cannot tell you for sure when you have ovulated. The only way to know for sure when you've ovulated is by tracking a few things. So that would include your cervical mucus. Now your cervical mucus is basically that discharge that comes out um, throughout the days of your cycle. And your cervical mucus will change depending on which time you or at which point you are at in your cycle. Typically, fertile cervical mucus is like egg white consistency. So it's really stretchy, it's clear, and typically this is the type of mucus that really is um, released via the cervix to protect the sperm 
and allow it to actually enter into the uterus so that it can go ahead and fertilize the egg. So tracking your cervical mucus is one of the things that you need to be doing if you're using the fertility awareness method. Some other things that you may need to do in the fertility awareness method, because there are different types of FAM, and that would include checking your basal body temperature. Now, your bo basal body temperature is tested the first thing when you wake up in the morning, before you even like look at your phone, get out of bed, drink water, before you do anything, you take a thermometer and check your temperature. And you have to keep track of this because the trend, so in other words, when you look at your temperature over time, you'll be able to see when your basal body temperature has spiked. And that's an indication that you have ovulated. So the, um, the basal body temperature reading will basically tell you like retrospectively, it won't tell you about when you will ovulate, it will tell you when you have ovulated already. And so keeping track of that will tell you when you are um, fertile. As well as doing other things like checking the uh, position of your cervix, which changes throughout the month. This can also give you clues about whether you are um, in your fertile period or not. And then also keeping track of your period is something that you should be doing. So you should be documenting whether it's in a period tracking app or just manually uh, documenting your period. And another thing that you can do is use ovulation test strips. It's something that is not required, but may actually just help you to give like an extra data point to be able to see whether or not you are in a fertile period. Now, the fertility awareness method and let me know if you want me to dive into this particular method in a future um, episode. But ultimately, the fertility awareness method can be used both to help you get pregnant and to help you not get pregnant. So if you remember earlier, I mentioned that you can use the pullout method in combination with another method. It's a FAM, right? So you can use the pullout method in combination with FAM. And the way you would do this is by determining when you are going to be in your fertile period. In other words, when you've ovulated. And then during that time, you can actually utilize an extra contraceptive method. So for example, the pull-out method or potentially even um, a barrier method like condoms. And so the fertility awareness method is a great method to help to prevent pregnancy. But like I said, if you want to use it to actually get pregnant, then it'll give you an idea as to when you are your most fertile in your cycle and where you should actually be trying to conceive. And so ultimately the fertility awareness method is a fantastic hormone-free contraceptive method or family planning method but it also helps to improve your overall awareness of your body and your menstrual cycle. It's one of the things this fertility awareness method as well as uh, menstrual cups are probably two of the most like empowering things that you can learn to do to help you get more in tune with your body and just to help you understand your own body's um, fluctuations and how your own body works in general. I love this method. Okay, so now moving on to hormone-free contraceptive methods that are actually surgery. So <laughs> that requires surgery, right? So the first one is tubal ligation. So if you have completed your family and you don't want to have any more children and you are 100% sure about this decision, then tubal ligation may be an option for you. This would involve basically cutting off the communication between your ovaries and your uterus. So in order for the egg to actually make it into the uterus, it has to go via the fallopian tube. And if that fallopian tube is cut off or blocked for whatever reason, then the egg won't be able to make it into the uterus. And so with tubal ligation, you're basically stopping that um, 
that root of communication between the ovaries and the uterus. And so this would involve like tying off or cutting or blocking the um, tubes to prevent you from actually getting an egg into the uterus. Now, with regards to the side effects or the potential adverse effects of this, it is an operation. So you don't necessarily need to have like open abdomen surgery. Uh, this can be done via keyhole surgery. Um, but typically people will consider this as an option, let's say if they've had a Caesar and they're like 100% sure that that's the last baby that they ever want to have, then a tubal ligation can be done at the same time as cesarean section, you know, just after the baby has been delivered. Alternatively, if you have, let's say, had natural birth or maybe even have decided after you've had a cesarean section that you don't want any more children, then tubal ligation can be done as a minor, uh, well, as an operation through keyholes. In other words, lap, what we call laparoscopic surgery. So this contraceptive method is highly effective. Typically, if you change your mind and you want to reverse a tubal ligation, it's very difficult to do so. Oftentimes, these surgeries to reverse TLs are not successful. So this is definitely a contraceptive method only to consider if you are 100% sure that you are complete with your family and you don't intend to have any more children in future. The typical side effects of tubal ligation um, are related to having a surgical procedure so you may experience side effects from the anesthetic or from the surgery itself um, and typically this contraceptive method doesn't cause any long-term side effects although some people do experience heavier periods or more painful periods after they've had any type of surgery and so this may be a potential side effect of tubal ligation. And so the final hormone-free contraceptive method that is often overlooked and a very, um, actually, probably the most hormone-friendly option for you is to get your partner to have a vasectomy. So a vasectomy in a similar way to tubal ligation basically cuts off communication of the um, testicles to the penis, right? So essentially you would be cutting off the communication that allows sperm to actually make its way out of the penis. And so here it would involve minor surgery. Typically this can be done um, under local anesthetic. And this is another long-term contraceptive strategy. Um, but unlike tubal ligations, vasectomies can be reversed. And the success rate of a reversal ranges anywhere from 40 to 90%. And so this is a fantastic contraceptive method. Again, if you have decided that you are not intending to have any children, um, but potentially want to leave the door slightly ajar, and is also completely hormone and side effect free for you. I think as women, we've been conditioned to believe that we should bear the burden of family planning and contraceptive methods. And so really getting your partners to step up and take responsibility for the contraceptive choices is something that we should normalize. I think that this is a fantastic opportunity, especially for those um, families and couples who really are considering long-term contraception and they really don't want to go the hormone route, this is a great way for your partner to step up to the plate and to take more responsibility for your family planning. Mm -hmm.